Brandon Brands. What's up, everybody? Brian Fanzo, better known as iSocial Fans. And if you want to build a brand that matters, you need to jump on the podcast Brands on Brands on Brands with my good friend, Brandon. You guys are going to enjoy it. I had a blast. Jump on Brands on Brands on Brands. In a world where advertising is ignored, business is exposed, and the only constant is change. How do you build a brand that matters? Welcome to Brands on Brands on Brands, a home for those who think different and push their boundaries. This is where branding that matters lives. Now, here's your host, Brandon Berkmeyer. Hey everyone, it's Brandon Berkmeyer here. Thanks for tuning in to another show of Brands on Brands on Brands. This week, we have another great interview for you. We have Brian Fanzo, who is, if you haven't seen him speak, you need to go check it out. If you haven't listened to his podcast, you need to check it out. He is a translator of Geek Speak, a change evangelist, podcast host, MC, keynote speaker, social media marketing expert cross-generational communicator, and talks a lot about innovation and digital empathy. More specifically, he's famous for saying, push the damn button in his call to get more people to stop being afraid of telling their story through social media and through digital. I think he's one of the most authentic guys out there with his social media. He lets you in. He, he tells great stories, but he also lets you into the real life of Brian Fanzo. His podcast is iSocial, well, his handles iSocial Fans. His podcast is FOMO Fans. He also has another podcast with Amy Landino called Just Try This. Uh, he's everywhere, but if you want to find him, go to iSocial Fans and you will be able to connect with him one way or another. But without further ado, let's get into this episode. There's so much knowledge in here. I might have to cut it into two episodes. We'll see. Enjoy. Brandon Brand. All right, let's get started. First off, thank you so much to our guest, Brian Fanzo, for coming on the show today, man. Just thank you first off, first and foremost. Oh, my pleasure. Excited to be here. And I also like that with podcasting and video, we're the same height. Because when we met, we're definitely not the same height. So I'm glad that you're like on my level for the, for the show. Yeah, that's true. That's right. I posted a picture today and you're probably like, why did he do that? He should have tilted it. No, I like it. Hey, I, I, I'm already looking up to you. That's a good way to start. Right? <laughs> yes, I'm already looking up to the host. Uh, well, for those of you that don't know, uh, Brian, I mean, your schedule is insane. I feel like you're traveling every day somewhere new and because you're, you're speaking all the time and uh, you're on stage is talking, you know, putting out your message, which is, you know, helping people figure out how to use this thing called, called digital marketing. And I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to talk about that a little bit more. But what I love is you get out there and say, you know, let's stop being afraid of this thing called the internet and technology. And you, your personality, I think, precedes you. You definitely have an interesting background, but your personality, I think, jumps off out of the earbuds or off the screen if you're watching video. You create tons of social media content, which I think a lot of people are trying to crack the formula on that. <laughs> uh, I see you all over LinkedIn. You have podcasts. For those that don't know, you have a, a, a podcast called FOMO Fans, but you also have a, a podcast that you share with uh, Amy Landino called Just Try This, which is, they're both great. You're a technology evangelist. You're infamous, infamous for telling people to so stop being afraid of social media, create content, and as you say, press the damn button, which I don't know how long you've been saying that. How many years have you been saying that now? Uh, I guess it's like three years now. It was one slide on one deck, and it caught <laughs> fire, and then it turned into its own keynote and its own stickers and, and mantra now. Yeah, so why did let's start with that, because this, is, this has been following you around, right? This is your, your platform almost. Why did this become your battle cry? Why is this so important? You know, I think for me, I've never considered myself really a marketer or a salesperson. I'm more, you know, I was a computer science major. I'm a tech guy. I love bleeding edge technology, but more so than anything else, like my thing is how I like connecting great people with great people to do great things. And the vehicle for doing that early on in my career was things like SharePoint. And I worked in cybersecurity for the U.S. government and I helped different branches of the military collaborate. And then as technology kind of grew, I, I worked with you know, sales enablement programs and employee advocacy projects inside of companies. And then marketing really, you know, thanks to social media, you know, kind of explosion started to, you know, open my eyes to the possibilities of all of the other times we were always limited by scope and we were limited by the people that we knew. And social media for me was just like, it was a little bit of the wild, wild west. It was a little bit of this uh, ability to connect with people uh, no matter where they're at in the world in real time. I mean, as the iPhone grow, you know, grew as a, you know, I've had every version of the iPhone that's come out and I was 
you're the one hacking it and jailbreaking it and doing all kinds of things. I'm a, I'm a geek. But for me, one of the big things has been, you know, I've, I struggle when I was starting to get labeled as a kind of like a motivational speaker or Brian would say, people would say, Brian, I love your live videos. You talk marketing, but really you're an inspiration. And I was like, you know, at first it was a little bit hard. And then I was like, you know what? I'm fired up. I love what I do. I, I've built this now business and career that allows me to kind of show my passion. But the big piece of it was, I don't care if I motivate you, if you don't take action. And it was becoming very frustrating for me where I would have brands or businesses or even entrepreneurs say, Brian, we saw what we, we watched you speak. You blew my mind. You had me open to this new possibilities. We took all these notes. We brainstormed. And now we came back a year later and we're excited to learn more and hopefully take it to action. And I'm like, what have you been doing in the meantime? And, you know, it was a little bit of this desire to be perfect. Also, you know, if we look at content and digital in the last three years, we've definitely shifted away from polished, produced, perfect to real time at the right time, you know, the level of authenticity, you know, not saying that production doesn't matter, but there's like, you know, a new shift in kind of 50, 50 in that uh, arena. And that's my, that's my playground, right? My playground is, uh, you know, perfection's a fairy tale. Control is an illusion. Uh, I believe in kind of, you know, working kind of off the cuff and putting things out there. And so press the damn button was kind of like my call to action. Like don't, don't talk about it. Don't worry. And it's funny because, you know, as I started to give out stickers, people started to take pictures of them all over. And it's that moment. I think we all get it. And it's that weird world of video. Like I grew up wanting to be a sports center anchor and I wanted to be on ESPN. That was like what I wanted to be. And you know, when we think about video today, uh, especially video more so than anything else, we're, we're not competing with TV. We're competing with YouTube and, and social video, which is definitely much more organic, more real, also more forgiving. We're not trying to be, you know, like a, a great uh, anchor on TV. And so that was, that's to me was part of it. And it's really the staple, you know, for my entire business, because, you know, up until Meerkat, the live video platform came out, I wasn't a video guy. I wasn't known as a video guy. I think my, my YouTube channel had four videos on it prior to 2014. And then live video kind of came out and it was, it was my vehicle. It allowed me to be me. It allowed me not to worry about SEO and thumbnails and planning and all these other things that I'm not strong at. And it was like, get your message out, have fun, interact, be real and raw. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. And as that exploded for me, all of a sudden they were like, well, you're the video guy. And I was like, well, I'm a guy that allows myself to tell, I guess video allows me to tell my story, but really press the damn button isn't video. It's I believe every person has a story to tell. And I believe in the world we're living in right now, we have to compete with fake news and bad news. And so how do you cut through fake news and bad news? It's authenticity. It's real people doing real things and being real to themselves. And unfortunately right now, we don't have enough good stories being put out there. I think there's so many people that are, their story stuck within. It's, it's, that, it's, it's, a, it's behind that button being pushed. And so that's where for me, I try to just get people to say, hey, press the button, just, just do it. And that freedom, once you get used to it, I mean, the amount of emails that I get where people are like, Brian, you're right. Once I actually just started my podcast, it became a lot easier. Or Brian, once I finally you know, started using Instagram stories or whatever it may be. And so for me, press the damn button is more of a mantra that says, I'm tired of bad news and fake news. And until we have enough good people telling their story, we can't drown out all of that noise. And so I want people telling their stories. I want entrepreneurs doing it. And I have a little bit hidden agenda of, I don't like the mantra of faking until you make it, selling unicorns and rainbows and the world of that, you know, kind of existed for a while. And so for me, the more we get this kind of level of authenticity pushed out, the more it scares those, those that have been successful by faking it. And they'll, they'll disappear along with the fake news and the bad news. And we'll be able to kind of uh, connect good stories with good people. Yeah. Well, and what I love about that is there's, I think there's a method to the madness and people get they're a little bit afraid of pushing the button because they think they don't have something to say. And what's, what I think is very therapeutic about it is whether you send it out there to the world or not, you know, you pushing the button, you writing, you recording, whatever it is, you start to learn how to find your voice and your perspective, which a lot of us, especially if you were in corporate, I was in cor corporate for 17 years, you lose that, that, tool to practice how to find perspective. And I think something really spoke to me about how you present yourself, that, that it was, you're encouraging people to do this, even if you don't have a game plan, because I think you knew without, you know, like without being obvious about it, you're like, this, this is going to help you get it and figure out how to do it. Yeah, and I think for, for a lot of people too, I think it's not even the fact that they don't know if they have a voice, it's they don't know where to start. And there's this, there's this weird 
in, you know, inflection that we have where we're like, I'm not an expert. And like the breaking news is nobody's an expert and nobody wants to hear from an expert. We want to hear your point of view on your experience and your way of translating and putting it out there. Like my mantra, when I worked at the government, I, everyone, like I was labeled as Brian. They're like, oh, like Brian fans are the, the translator of geek speak. Like that was what my label was because I wasn't a, a master coder and I wasn't, you know, the you know, master at you know, managing these teams. But I found this niche where I could work with coders and computer science team and then translate it to the management staff to understand what was going on. And I would brief the joint chiefs of staff in the Pentagon and then they would tell me what they want from my team and I would translate that downstream. And I think today that's one of, one of those, those vehicles. And, and the big piece with me of pressing the damn button is you won't know what works or what's comfortable until you put it out there. And then once you get comfortable and you put it out there, now I'm saying, okay, let's put a strategy behind it. Let's not just, you know, spray fire everywhere. But until you press the damn button, you can't have a strategy. Like it's so, it's amazing how many people get stuck on the strategy phase when you're like, how do you even know what works? Are you comfortable telling your story? And I would say the number one mistake I believe most people make in this space is that you start by trying to tell your story where your audience is. Now, as a marketer, we're like, wait a second, duh, that's what, we're, that's what we should be doing. But as a storyteller, it's scary. It's different. It's real. It's, it's raw. You know, I get scared. I, you know, I still have it to this day, right? I've done over, you know, 3,500 live videos uh, since, uh, to, since the beginning of 2014. And I still, you know, I, I got LinkedIn Live. I, I brought up a plan for my LinkedIn Live. And then I recorded a couple of test episodes and I didn't like it. And I was like, you know what? I need to go back to the drawing board. And so I've, I still feel that. But the, the where I think people go wrong is they start where, try to start where their audience is first. And that's just one more variable that gets you to not do it. And so my, my recommendation to people is start where you're most comfortable. If you like to talk, create a podcast. And you're like, if you like, if you don't mind video, you like walking and talking, do walking and talking on live video. If you've been comfortable on webinars and, 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 delivering on webinars, go live on, you know, on a web camera through Facebook Live using a tool like Zoom. If you're more comfortable, you know, writing, you know, get out there and do a cadence where you're like, okay, this is an episodic series. I'm going to do, you know, uh, 10 episodes and this is going to be my story putting it out there. Whatever it is, start where you're most comfortable. And then once you get used to it, then you move to your second part. Podcasting for me was the answer. I will, I will say without hesitation, my success, my career, my business, with, especially with video, would not have existed without podcasting, which kind of sounds kind of weird, but I launched my first podcast seven years ago. And so I launched it because my mom said I came out of the womb talking. I've always loved talking, not scared to talk. I talk fast. I understand that, that side of it, but I've always got comfortable talking. And so for three years before I dove into video, I got used to telling stories, answering questions, multitasking, you know, being able to, to interview people, but also be interviewed myself. And so when live video came out, people were like, Brian, how are you not distracted? How are you reading the comments? How are you that comfortable telling that story? And it was because I, I, I started where I was most comfortable. And then as I realized, okay, live video is a great place. Now produced videos. I, you know, I do three videos a week for LinkedIn every single week because that's where my client base is. It's hiring me to speak. And I would not be doing that. I would not be comfortable doing that if it all hadn't started, if I hadn't started where I was most comfortable, which is podcasting. You know, and I'm a, I'm a, without question, a podcast fanboy. Hence, hence why I have, you know, three podcasts at the moment. But that's where I think, I think a lot of mistakes are made. And we have to stop thinking like a marketer and start thinking just like as a storyteller, right? You, it's not that we want an expert. We don't need a thought leader. You don't need to know everything. Uh, and I would actually argue the more willing you're to say, willing to say, I don't know within sharing your content, it actually adds validity to what you do know. And that's, that's a fun element. And you don't learn any of this until you start. Like, I, I think that's, to me, the, the coolest part about what my job is, is that oftentimes people are told to do video. They're told to tell their story. They're told personal branding is important. They're told LinkedIn. But I try to shift the perspective and hopefully just push them to that edge where they press the bam button. And then they press the button and they're like, oh, how did I not do this years ago? And we all have that feeling and it's not perfect. And trust me, you'll go back and watch and you're like, oh my goodness, that's what I thought was good back then. But it's that moment. It's getting people to open their mind, have perspective, a little bit of confidence and put yourself out there. And that freedom that it enables is, uh, it's what fuels me every day. And I, and I, it's exciting to watch other people get fueled by that same confidence. Yeah. And I would, for, to be transparent, when I was figuring out, okay, like what can, what are Brian and I going to talk about today? I was, I was worried. I was like, there, there's so much that you, you, you're out there all the time. You put out so much content, like what's going to be interesting, but the, the thing that I, I thought, you know, at the end of the, all of this, if they could take away 
either A, just the confidence that they should be doing more to put themselves out there and find their voice and perspective. I think you're the perfect person to show them how to do that. But then you even go a little bit deeper in it and it's like, okay, once you've done that, here are some other things to start thinking about. And I want to get into that in a, in a bit, minute, but I want to give you the credit that's due too. Personally, I guess first I met you at, at Social Media Marketing Run. I shook your hand, said hello. And this is because, you know, A, I started following you. I, you know, I found you out there in the, on the interwebs. And I was like, there are a few people that I really want to start to get to know out there because this is what I'm going to be doing. And, and to do, you know, so like I tell everyone out there, if you want to get to know people, you actually have to put yourself out there in real life situations. You have to be fans of them. You have to follow them. You have to interact. And then if they're doing something, show up. And social media marketing world happens to be a place where there's a lot of people that we all kind of like and follow each other's stuff that so I was really, I appreciate A, that you were, you were out there in the hallway, shaking hands, saying hi to people, taking the time to do that and not like hiding it like at some places where you're like <laughs> yeah. on stage. Well, no, I appreciate that. And to me, that's the biggest piece, right? And I think, you know, the greatest compliment for me uh, when someone meets me for the first time offline is they say that you're the same person I've been following online, right? I don't believe there's an online versus offline world, just like I don't believe there's a business versus personal world. I think we're living now where we connect with people and it's, it's our job to kind of to do that. And I think the, the barrier that, that sometimes are put between there, especially in the speaker world, um, I'm trying my best to debunk that in every realm I could possibly can because, you know, like, how do I get to know people? How do I connect? And, you know, I give you credit because there's a, one of the most frustrating things for me is, you know, I put it out there that I tell people that social media will not replace a handshake. But if you use it really well, the very first time you meet somebody, it turns a handshake into a hug, or it gives you the opportunity to have more handshakes, or I like to say, turn handshakes into hugs and selfies, right? Like, I, I, I really do embrace that. And as, as crazy as that sounds, and that's something I put out there, the amount of times that people are like, Brian, I saw you there, or you were over here, but I didn't bother you. I didn't come over and reach out. And in this world we're living in now, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of fun, because there's nobody that I believe is off limits and there's, which is kind of, you know, a little scary for some people, but I think there's also these opportunities that if you're not seizing them yourself, you only have yourself to blame. So, you know, kudos to you coming over uh, and, and connecting and you've done a great job of kind of staying on top of me with coming on here. Cause I did want to be a guest and uh, you know, for me getting schedules and things lined up is a little bit uh, chaotic at the moment, but that's no excuse. I'm excited to be here. And I, you know, I appreciate the kind words. Well, yeah, no, I get it, man. There's, you're traveling everywhere, speaking everywhere. So I just, I appreciate you taking the time. I do love that you call yourself the pager wearing millennial. Where, where did that come from? Because for me, I was like, was that a millennial thing? Was that Gen X? Like, why is that the, you know, the thing that makes you stand out? So weirdly, I was working in um, the technology space. I was, I actually, it was the biggest event I ever spoke at in my entire life. Uh, before I became a professional speaker, which is the irony here. Uh, in 2012, I spoke at uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services Conference, and I was one of the opening sessions, 13,000 people in the audience. It was a, just one of the, at the time, I didn't realize how big and epic it was until, you know, looking back, but I got interviewed afterwards, and they were like, Brian, you put a, the, the interviewer was talking, and we were, you know, like, on being broadcast at the, at the event, and they were like, Brian, you put a, a new view, a new look onto millennials. And they were like, we've always, and the, the label they had kind of put down on me, was like, we always thought of millennials that were born with Facebook and an iPhone in their hand. And remember, this is 2012, 2013. So for me, I immediately fired back and I said, well, funny enough, like, not only did I not have Facebook when I graduated college, because I gave up my EDU address, I had a flip phone. I was like, but I know what a pager is. And the, the guy like looked at me and I was like, yeah, I'm actually a pager wearing millennial. I was born in 1981. And that like that second clicked. And it was one of those things where the next two or three interviews I got, they're like, can you explain to me this? And, and, and I would say the other part of that was that later that same day at that same event, a lady came up to me and she said she was emotional. And she's like, she's like, Brian, I just want I want to FaceTime. I want, I want to show you something on your phone. And she, I don't believe it was even FaceTime. I think it might have been Skype on her phone. And she opened her phone and it's her son. And she, her son was about seven years younger than I was, six years younger than I was. And she said, my son has been an embarrassed to be labeled a millennial and been ashamed because people were kind of associating these, you know, the labels are lazy and entitled and, you know, whatever that may be. And she said, she was sending video clips of my session being proud and wearing it as a badge of honor. And I can tell you up until that moment, I didn't think of it as a bad thing at all. I didn't even like, to me, it was like, it's, it's one variable of a generation that I was born into. I didn't get to pick when I was born. Like, it's just, for me, it was like, wow, it's this up and coming group. And when she said that, and she said that it helped, I mean, that was the day I, and I remember I switched my Twitter bio, like literally that evening at the hotel and put millennial in my bio and said, if some people are being shamed or they're, they don't like the, the title, 
if I can do my little part and own it and, and become that, you know, and, and I'm, I don't talk about only millennial topics. Millennial doesn't really define me. It's, you know, the years that I was born, but it, it is something that I've kind of owned. I do talk a lot about cross-generational uh, communication, but funny enough, I usually am giving more advice to millennial Gen Z on how we can communicate upstream than the other way. Like I kind of flip it a little bit, but yeah, the page away millennial, you know, it's just one of those things that I think, generalization sucks, right? Like labeling people, no one, but we do it, especially in marketing. And it's important to understand that like the generation, especially, you know, let's say post 19, you know, anyone's born after 1980, the amount of change that existed for that generation, you know, 1980 to now is at a pace we've never seen before. It's, you know, I, I mean, I, I know the, my, my friends that dropped out of college, they benefited by getting six, seven figure jobs in the internet space before the internet boom and i remember in college being pissed that i went to college because i you know i knew the internet boom as it was and then of course that fell apart and then you know then as social media rise came out and i was a napster user burning cds in my in my dorm room i like to say that was my very first entrepreneur job was i was uh, i was burning cds and selling them to people on campus and i would even put like a little winamp skin on the top of it so for me, like I, I am a proud millennial and I, you know, I have three uh, Gen Z daughters and uh, I know that I don't relate it with everyone that's millennial because I am on the, the elder millennial uh, scheme, but it is important to kind of remember that we all kind of come from different spaces. And I mean, the truth is I relate with those that were born in 1975 more than I was born those in 1990 and we're we kind of generationalize it, but uh, it's a fun, it's a fun thing for me. And if, if it's something that someone remembers or something that helps clarify when someone's you know, stereotyping someone. Uh, I think that's just, you know, the small thing that I get to do. Yeah, no, I love that. And it, it, it I think it speaks to me too, because I'm the, the, the bottom end of Gen X. I'm 79 and there was a weird split somewhere right there. So I was like the youngest Gen Xer that was like, Yep, you're at that Oregon Trail side, right? I'm 75 like, to 85. Yeah. We all know what Oregon Trail was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I didn't build any computers. Like what that, you know, I didn't build any of this technology that we're all using these days. So it was like, you know, I'm like in that in between. So I get that. I do want to talk about, so for those out, people out there that are, okay, they're getting comfortable with creating media around themselves, this idea of whatever it is, their business, their brand, they're just connecting. What I like is you talk about it. I, th I want to think about it for entrepreneurs and how they use it for their business and for growing uh, in that way. You talked a little bit about in your last podcast episode, this idea of niching down. I want to talk a little bit about that because I was just having a conversation about this with, with someone. The idea that there is an advantage to niching down, but there's also an advantage to not, as long as you're, you're clear about how you do that. I want you, I want, do you mind touching a little bit about what, that, what you were talking about in that episode? And I'll, I'll ask my question. No, of course not. I love, um, and so for me, like, you know, the riches are in the niches, right? We've, that's a phrase that we heard. And for me, you know, I went to school, I went to college, I was a computer science major that was the president of my fraternity and the assistant captain of the ice hockey team. Nobody on hockey was in the fraternity. No one in fraternity was a computer science major. Like I was kind of like that unique person, but I connected all of those worlds. And we were always, I was always amazed because it was like, they were like, Oh, I would never hang out. And then like first night we're hanging out, they become best friends. Right. And it's like this idea of like, Hey, we're all not that different. And so I was always intimidated when someone would tell me, well, Brian, your success has been limited because you haven't found your niche. And I'm one that when someone tells me I can't do something, I, I, I will prove them wrong, right? It's like, I'm very good at that, that idea of, you know, like, and actually the first podcast I launched, which was called Smack Talk, um, I actually interviewed, I sat down with John Lee Dumas and Lewis Howes um, at the very first social media marketing world. And I was like, guys, this, I want to talk about like these couple of things. And they were like, the, the only way you will be successful in a podcast is if you niche it down. And I immediately went back and created a podcast that was the opposite of a niche, and it's called Smack Talk, which stands for Social Media, Mobility, Analytics, and Cloud Computing. Like, I mean, I went and I was like, you know what? I'm going to prove them wrong. And it's been sponsored by Adobe, IBM, Samsung, Dell, all of these brands that I've been able to sponsor the podcast for. But there's also an element that I had to learn that once you have a niche or if you have a niche, there is some power there, right? There's some power from association, from people being able to talk about what you do. Like one of my, my struggles was when someone talks about me, they talk about, you know, passion and they'll maybe mention a couple of things, but what are you quote unquote known for? And so what I, like my message to people is that if you have a niche, if you have a, something that is your like one primary focus, own it, double down, be the best at it. But also remember that there's a possibility that niche goes away or fades or disappears still is there, right? You still have to kind of, think a little bit bigger. But for those that are like me, that were like, man, I don't have a niche. What I want to tell you is that 
you still have the chance to be successful. You have to do things a little bit differently, but you also have the opportunity to, to discover your niche down the, down the way, right? Like if you would have told me in 2012, 2013, that I would be doing something on video, I would have said you were the craziest person of all time because I was like, video wasn't my thing. I wasn't just video wasn't something that was even a niche that I would have uh, you know, focused on. And like, even now as a speaker, people will say, well, like what audiences do you talk to? And I was like, well, I have four primary talks. Each talk can do three different verticals or three different industries. And those three pretty much don't cross over. Right. And so like I get, I get some really cool opportunities where I speak to the, the dental hygienist insurance policy convention. The next week I go to a, a pet influencer convention. Then I get to go to IBM and I talk about, you know, artificial intelligence. And then the very next day I'm speaking at digital summit on 10 marketing lessons from the fire festival. Right. And so it's allowed me to, to have a, a, a very big span, but it's also, I, I will say without question that if I had a niche when I started, my success probably would be equal, if not greater than it, than it is at the moment. But I'm so glad that it didn't allow myself, I didn't stop myself from trying to go after success because I hadn't discovered it yet. Because I mean, honestly, when someone asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, all through high school, my answer changed, you know, with the wind, like, you know, it went from everything from like a high school guidance counselor to a sports center news anchor to a radio disc jockey to, I mean, like, I mean, you give, you give me the, that, that space and I was open to it. And, and, you know, I like to be part of like, Hey, I'm proof. Like if you're not sure about this, like I'm living proof that, you know, you can kind of pivot, you can be a little bit about all these different things, but if you're passionate about it, you keep it real and you're able to kind of, you know, have a, a good amount of knowledge on these different topics. Uh, it's definitely, it can be definitely a superpower and it works really well for me. Yeah. I, I think that that spoke to me because, you know, I came from a business, you know, after spending 17 years at ad agencies, being a generalist, like there was many choices along the way where, do you want to become the digital buyer or the magazine buyer or the out of home? I was like, no, I'm going to stay the strategy person. And then when I jumped out of that corporate world, I was like, oh my God, I, I, I can't be a, an Instagram expert or a Facebook expert or, a, you know, what in the, go down the list. It started to scare me. It's like, okay, I guess I have to pick an industry then. Okay. I'll be, do I, am I the restaurant guy? Am I the, you know, the plumber guy? Like, what are you like, who, who am I doing marketing for? And I kept trying to go down these roads and none of them felt right. Cause I was like, in, in 10 years, I don't want to be the, the restaurant marketing guy, you know, but I think in trying it in starting, like it, it did help. I realized the benefit. I said, okay, I'll, what if I am the restaurant marketing guy? Let's try that. I'll write a couple of things about that. It did help me focus my writing. It helped me focus my prospecting. It helped me know who I needed to get in front of. It also made me realize this isn't who I want to be. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I moved forward to take a step back and then refocus, but there, you know, I think that, having fear stop you because you're not sure where to niche uh, is, is one of the biggest messages I can take away from what you're giving people today. Because I think being able to try things, you might figure out that your niche has to do with a certain type of behavior, a certain approach, a certain place in someone's process, whatever the thing is, but you got to get out there and be doing the work and being active in figuring out who you are and, and narrowing your perspective. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's, that's beautifully said. And I think one of the things for me that, I, you know, I, we talk about passion and purpose, right. And I, and I like to flip a little bit on the head and it's been something that I take a lot of pride in is that I, I can't say that I was passionate about every job I've ever had, but I found a way to be passionate about the work I was doing. And along the way, it allowed me to succeed because of that, but it also allowed me to open up all these. I mean, how many other people can say they worked in cybersecurity at a data center? I played semi-professional poker, and now I'm a keynote speaker on, on marketing generational conversation and social media, right? Like, like, but because I was able to be passionate, so I think for those that are out there that are struggling, to your point, you know, like be passionate about a vertical or an industry or something that you want to do. But the, the, I think the part of the other thing that is struggles or that frustrates me is that we do live in a kind of a shiny object world. I do host a podcast called FOMO Fans, which stands for the fear of missing out. So I'm part, I'm part of the ones that understand that. But I think one of the things that I, I, get, I get frustrated with, and, and live video was a big, big propeller of this, was that when someone didn't know what their niche was and they saw live video taking off, they were like, that's going to be my niche. And you're like, wait a second, are you good at it? Is that something you like doing? Is it something you want to do? And not to mention, nobody knew what the heck they're doing. I would still argue most of us still don't know what we're doing in that space. You know, and like, so chatbots is a great one, right? Like all of a sudden you were expert in chatbot. Now, and I would always ask like, oh, so you're a coder. Oh no, okay. So you were really good on lead generate. Oh wait, no, you're really good at SEO. Wait, you're really good at building a funnel. Wait, oh no, you weren't really good at any of those things. You just saw chatbots as a niche that no one was owning. And I think that is from a from a frustration part for me, I would much rather someone kind of stay figure out uh, you know top level rather than just 
trying to own something that just makes no sense because not only is it short term, but I think that's the bigger picture here is that I'm playing a long term game in everything I'm doing, right? I'm building a brand, a reputation and a level of trust that's not associated with one network not associated with one type of medium, not even really associated with one industry. I want people to understand who I am, what I'm about, what the results are that I can drive forward. Therefore, you know, my saying is you don't build, I don't build a following on a social network. I build an, an entire digital community that will follow me no matter where I go. And that to me is my secret. My secret is, I mean, my, people will look and like, well, your Instagram following is not that big. Or how'd you get that Twitter following when there's not many people on Facebook? And I was always like, Growing one individual channel was never a goal. I use the channel for what it's worth and I try to customize my content there. But ultimately, I don't care if you only subscribe to my podcast or you only follow me on, on Instagram or maybe you just discovered me on LinkedIn. The idea for me is you get to know who I am. And then as I pivot, as I launch my book, I have merchandise that I'm working on right now. It, it, the success level of that, like, I mean, I sold, I sold, I mean, without even doing public, I did private in, uh, messages to this mastermind that I launched June 1st. I mean, I wanted to get 20 people and I had 80 people via private message that applied and qualified that were willing to, and I was with no funnel, no sales, no public promotion. It was me, you know, kind of building that. And I think that's that result of, you know, being able to do that. So yeah, for those that are out there, if you have a niche, own it, thankful, thank, thank people that you have it. Um, also remember, like, there are plenty of people that had a niche on Vine. And if they had a niche on Vine and they weren't really good at content creation or community engagement, when they went to Instagram, they had a big following, but their content sucked. And they disappeared and we don't even know their names now, right? But then you have other ones that were big on like Musical.ly, and, but they, were, they understood that Musical.ly was just a vehicle that they needed to be more who they were. And so like I mean, a good friend of mine, uh, Opera Americana, she's, she's the perfect example where she built a huge following lip syncing. But she started to realize it was her personality that people connected with and her realness as a, you know, a, a emerging teenager. And she's a talented musician. And so when you know, Musical.ly got bought and there was some changing around, people were asking me, like, Brian, well, she had a niche, but yet now she's known for you know, kind of this bigger piece. And she's, I was like, yeah, but she understood her talent, but she also invested beyond just that one platform. And in, in today's day and age, I mean, I, I have this question all the time. People say, Brian, what would you do if Twitter disappeared? Because Twitter is my favorite platform. It's the platform I use the most. Uh, and they would say, what would you do if Twitter disappeared? I was like, I'd be really frustrated because I'd be posting 30 Facebook updates a day because <laughs> Twitter is like my outlet of just like, uh, you know, blasting stuff out there. And, but I don't think of that as limiting me or, uh, you know, stopping the, my community or my business. And I think that's also important. And you, know, you have people like Pat Flynn, perfect example of someone that has done a niche and owned it and done it really well, but also now has branched out and he's got products and he's you know, launched a video uh, YouTube channel. And I think if you, and this is probably my, I will wrap the niche conversation up with this, that if you have a niche, look at those that also have a niche that are doing it your way and, and be inspired by them. If you don't have a niche, follow those that don't have one and, and understand how they're doing it. I think we sometimes we like look up to someone and they have a, like I, and I made this mistake. I can tell you, I made this hundred percent. I made this mistake. I will, I will own it. And I tried to build my business off of a speaker that had a niche. And when I did it, 2017 was my worst year I'd ever had in business since I graduated college. And I, 2016 was my best year. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to follow this guy's lead. And then all half, like halfway through the year, I'm like, what am I doing? This, I'm not comfortable. It's not me. The content's, you know, it's just not what I was. And so now when I look back, I'm like, okay, the people I, I, I'm listening and learning from all, all types, but the people that I want to mirror stuff after, the people that business, you know, methodologies that I want to follow are those that also kind of live in my lane of a little bit of ADHD, a little bit of fun, a little bit of, uh, you know, realness. And uh, that kind of helps things out as well. But yeah, it's a, it's a fun conversation. And I also think this whole idea of a generalist, there was another one, like, kind of like millennial. I loved when someone called me a generalist. Then when someone was like, oh, well, you're kind of like a, you know, those that teach can't do. And I was like, well, no, actually those that teach know how to, to actually interpret what, what is being done in a way that helps other people, right? And like, weirdly enough, now the superpower that people have, I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk is a genius because he can relate what is going on in his crazy world, what goes on in the marketing world and goes on in the giant agency that he runs. He relates it in a real way. He is technically a teacher that creates so much content we could, none of us could ever keep up. But it's the irony that 10 years ago, if you, you were doing it Gary's way, they would tell you, oh, you're a generalist. Oh, you don't know enough about anything. And now it's like, hey, those, of, those that are smart but can relay it and teach others are who we put on the, plat, on, on the pedestal. I think that's kind of a fun day and age that we live. Yeah, I'd say that that, that resonates with me too because when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, because I was like, I'm not going back to corporate. I need to find my voice. I need to become relevant. 
and you know, set myself up for the next 30 years of my life or whatever it is. I, 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 I was lost for a little bit. I was like, I'm creating this stuff. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I don't want to be a consultant. I don't want to, whatever it is. But I did find a couple of people and what they were doing well that I liked was they were building community and they were creating products out of community building. They, you know, they first built something, they put their voices out there. They had people rally around them and they figured out what those people needed that they could, what problems they could solve, which seems obvious, but it may not be obvious to build a community first based on your perspective and your content. And that was a light bulb. And those are the people that I like, because I was drawn to them and the way they did things, it just set me up for having the right examples to follow. So thank you for sharing that as, as a perspective, because it's, it's so simple, but I don't think people like think about it like that. They don't go the step farther to say, who's building something in a way that I'd want to build something. And I think that also comes into, it does sound simple, but the weirdest thing, like if I had to give you one advice on how to stand out online right now is be consistent, be crazy consistent. And that doesn't mean you have to do something every day. So for some reason, we, we look at the word consistent. That means like, oh my God, I don't have time for consistency. No, consistency is built on this idea of managing expectations. If you're going to drop a podcast every week, drop a podcast every week. If you can't uh, reply to tweets, but on the weekends, put it out there that you're going to reply on the weekends, but you better well be there on the weekends, right? Consistent. That's like the simplest, like it's the easiest thing for any of us to do yet. You know, like every single tweet over, I, mean, I have over 190,000 tweets that have come out of my, my iSocial fans uh, brand. I said, Twitter is my favorite one. Every single reply, I am very proud to say, has come from me. Not one. Re- now, I schedule, I use a tool, you know, Buffer or Agora Pulse for, for scheduling out some content, but every single reply has been me. And because I remember 2014, I put it out there and I was so mad when I was getting replies from those that were like the bigger names that were saying, well, I outsourced that. And I was like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this expectation to the world. Now, granted, I knew at the time that it was going to be crazy. I didn't know how much time that would be committed, but I mean, I probably spent an hour a day replying to engagement on social, but it's also what helps me build a business. And the other part that you said that I think is so important is that, you know, I think community is the future of business. I believe innovation is crazy and wild. And we don't really know how AI or 5G technology or virtual reality and augmented reality, we don't really truly know how that world's going to look. And I think if you, if you focus more on building a community, that you stay close enough to understand the needs and the problems, but I would say even more so than the problems, you understand a way to give them solutions. That is where you have, like, you will never get replaced by AI or any of this technology or job market if you have that community. But it t- I tell you, the hardest part about community is there's no, no easy button. <laughs> Not only does it take time because you're building trust and rapport, but it's also one of those things that if you aren't real with who you are at your core, I truly don't believe building community is possible because it, it gets to a point where you either have to, you have to love it, put up or shut up. You have to be you know, real and honest. And I remember I sent it out to, you know, for me, November, November 3rd, 2013, uh, my mom actually had messaged me. We were talking and she just asked me a question. She said, Brian, one of your strong suits has always been that you walked your own walk and you were unapologetically authentic. And I was like, mom, you know, like, I appreciate it. She's like, are you doing that online? And at the time I was like, you know what? I was spending like 30 minutes crafting a perfect Facebook post. Or I was like, ooh, I'm, I'm going to speak with the government this week. So I need to take my hat off for my profile picture. Right. And I was like, I was all of a sudden like, and I'm like, wait a second, what I became really good at offline and all of a sudden it clicked. Cause I was like, wait, that's why I don't like social media. Like I did not like social media from a business, but I loved it because I was a Pittsburgh sports fan and I used it for all that kind of things. But it was that day, November, you know, and I remembered I walked into my bed, my bathroom and with a Sharpie wrote in my mirror, be yourself. And I underlined it three times. And since that day, I said, you know what? I'm going to be myself online and I'm going to focus on building community, not products. And I'm going to build trust so that I can maintain that over long term. Now, the roller coaster that comes with that is you, they have to kind of roll with your life, right? At, at that point, I was working at a data center company. I became an entrepreneur that I owned a marketing agency. I sold that. I became a consultant and then I started speaking. At that same time, I got divorced. I launched the thir- second podcast, a third podcast. I doubled down on live video on this app called Meerkat, which if no one realizes it, that's probably part of my mistake. Like I have more followers on Meerkat today than I do on all my networks combined. Uh, when, when it had reached its you know, pl- plateau, Gary Vaynerchuk or Jimmy Fallon was number one. Give me, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk was number two and I was number three. It was my 15 minutes of fame. And that app died 365 days to the day that it had launched. And I was like, wow, good job, Brian. Like, <laughs> you know, like, so like, if you look at it for me, like the communities had to go through this involvement with me. But the reason I believe that I've been successful at that is because I started off that day saying, hey, it's me. 
I'm going to talk about life as it is. I have no problem talking ADHD, divorce, kids, like my life. Now, for everyone that's out there, you don't have to be as transparent as me. You don't have to talk as fast as me. You don't have to. I, I, what, I, what I challenge people is risk versus reward every aspect of you putting yourself out there. And when you're doing that, please remember to ask yourself questions that you answered many years ago. Like in 2014, putting your kids out there, putting my kids on social, I'm like, that's not really a trend I want to do. Like, why would I do that? Like, that's not something, you know, and then as we became more real and raw and as social media has kind of transitioned, all of a sudden that became like a no brainer for me. And I think there's a, there's a limitation for many of us putting our story out there that we are still acting on our 2014, 2015 decisions in 2019, a world that is nowhere close to the world that we lived in back then. And, and that's where this whole press the damn button for me is because I can truly tell you, like, this, there's nothing more exciting for me than finding people that have these amazing stories and just helping them tell people. And, you know, as a marketer, as an ad guy, you would love this part of it is if I told everybody 10 years ago that you could reach one or two people every single day that are your target demographic and you could build trust on them every single day, every single marketer, every ad person would buy that. They would double down. They would say, this is the holy grail. And then weirdly enough, the idea of public followers and likes and vanity metrics became this whole world of we want all of these numbers. And I can tell you, I, I don't have the biggest numbers on a lot of channels, but just recently I was the only influencer on a program that we were running uh, that had under 100,000 followers. So I had like 16,000 followers on Instagram um, and everyone else had over 100,000. I was the number one seller of the product that we promoted on the, on the channel by 4X. Because what I told them whenever they signed me up, I was like, what is your goals? And they were like, well, this is our demo. We want this age group and we need them to take this kind of action at this dollar point. And I was like, home run, I got you. And they were like, wait, how do you think you're going to compete with the ones that have bigger numbers? I was like, they might have bigger numbers that are going to reach a broader number of people. I have people that will jump before I say jump. And I also know how to craft things for my audience. And, I, and that's just a result of these years of putting it out there. And I, I tell you what, it's, I'm so passionate about this because I do believe we're living in the greatest time in history. Someone like yourself, like you said, hey, I w you were inside the corporate world. I did corporate as well for nine years. And I will still say corporate was easier than entrepreneur life as much as, as, much as we get like the, the entrepreneur life gets glamorized. I would gladly go back and let someone else do my, my business development, my sales, my invoicing, my HR, my okay. <laughs> all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think to, you, to your point, like when, when you are merging out and you're like, hey, I want to find your voice, how amazing is it that Thanks to technology and social media, I mean, we don't even pay for these tools, right? Like, we have the ability to tell our story. And I will, this will sound a little harsh, but if you're not telling your story today, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not telling your story, you're doing a disservice to yourself and your community. And if, you, if that maybe get, that gets you to put it over the blind, because if right now bad news and fake news is getting amplified, it's your responsibility to tell good stories and amplify good things. Because the more we focus on the bad, the more the bad gets, gets the oxygen. But the more that we individually each tell our story, all of a sudden the bad and the, and the fake start to disappear. And I, I, mean, I, I really do believe the world's a really good place and social media is going to allow us to see that. Unfortunately, right now, we have a bunch of people that blame social media and technology for the bad things when really the bad things have always lived there social media and technology is just amplified. Yeah. It's shining a light on it for sure. And I, uh, what's, what's funny is I, I had just written a post not too long ago. It was on LinkedIn and it was, you know, wake the F up was the title. And it was written like to the me from 10 years ago. Basically, I wish someone had said that to me. That was like, listen, you, you're on this road. That's fine. Being corporate's great, but you need to start doing something for you. You need to start investing in yourself, explore, you know, expanding your horizons and thinking about personal growth, whether that's experiences or finding your point of view, your perspective, whatever it is. It felt like it was, it's nice for like writing to yourself because you, you can be a little more like, you don't feel like you're going to piss people off, but I'd love to hear about this. You know, since we've talked about this idea of putting things out there online, things like that, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, once you start doing that and you start seeing more of that from other people, this idea that I know you like to talk about that you have some, some ideas on about digital empathy, but I'd like to talk about it in the, con in the context of wins and losses, like things that have, that have kind of come to you that have been successful, not successful, and how that's kind of crafted this idea for you. For sure. No, I love the way you set that up for me. And, and, you know, I th and I think when we look at this, and I will tell everyone to think about it right now, if you had to think about your business or your life in 2019, if you had to come up with four of the best things that happened to you, and that, that, that most successful things that happened this year, and then I want you to write down four of the things that suck, the worst things that happened, I will bet money 
that you will come up with the four bad things a heck of a lot faster than you'll come up with the four good things. It's just like when we post a comment or we post content and we have a hundred people tell us they love it and one person tell us they didn't like it, we spend all of our time on that one person diving in. And so I have a, I have a phrase that I call screenshot awesomeness. It sounds corny. I started it when I was in the government and the problem was, and my team, we were training, we were doing all these things and I had a boss that would come in and say, your reviews of your, your training classes are great. But what is it exactly your team is doing? I mean, we were running, you know, 34 employees, uh, you know, 19 and a half million dollar a year budget for the government. You know, thank you for your tax dollars. Um, and, you know, we were, we were, and what I started to look at my team, I said, we have all these great emails and we would get messages from generals and we would go out on site and these people would tell us how much we made their jobs easier. But yet when, when we were worried, when we go back to the drawing board, our walls were fall, we were, we were set up with all of the, the open trouble tickets and all the complaints. And so I said, every time something good, no matter what, screenshot it, right? Just screenshot it on your laptop. And we're going to put that in a folder. And then each month or each, you know, we end up doing every other month, we're going to put everybody's screenshots into one giant bucket. And together, we're going to kind of look at this. And in the world we're living in right now, life is tough. And, and unfortunately, like I, I even think of it for me growing up, like I was sheltered. I was very blessed to grow up very well off. Um, I grew up in a, you know, not only in a family that was loving and connected and, and we were, you know, I was very, my parents were very successful. I, you know, I had great friends. I, my family owned a, a frozen yogurt shop that my friends worked at. I, I just really, and for me, like things like depression or things like fear or things like hatred or things like bullying, like, yes, I was bullied, but I was also like the fairly well off white kid that was bullied, like at a level of like picked on in school in the bathroom, right? Not at a level that the world is looking at right now. And to me, the thing that is so exciting is that there's so many awesome moments in our lives. And if we spent more time remembering that, and then also capturing them, like the weird thing is when I say screenshot obstinacy, people are like, well, yeah, I do that a couple of times. I'm like, no, every time something good happens like screenshot it. And it sounds weird. I'm like, I mean, I looked at it this year, um, just before uh, May 1st, I had like 4,100 screenshots uh, that, that were on my desktop just for the first five months of the year. And it was like every tweet where someone said, Hey, Brian, your presentation was the first one I liked, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. But I can also tell you, I lost two very large six figure client deals that same month. And it kicked me square in the stomach and I was hurting. And I went to that folder and realized, Hey, you know what? I'm still doing good. I, you know, and I think with the highs and the lows, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you that failure doesn't happen. I'm also not going to tell you failure doesn't suck because it does. And it hurts and it's down, you know, for me, the divorce, and I'm the one that asked for the divorce. So like there's, I, I've, I've had lots of highs and lows, but part of that is you want to be able to remember the good times, but also when you're putting yourself out there and you have the bad times, there are people that, that you don't want, because like reaching out is, you know, even when I was going through the divorce, like they, everybody tells you, you know, you'll be lonely. You push everybody away. But if you're already put yourself out there, it doesn't matter how hard you push. People are already in, right? They're already, they're already feeling who you are. And so I look at things like the suicide rate, or I look at the things like, you know, when, when someone, a marketer, I'll put this in a marketer perspective, when a marketer is worried about using data because it might come across as creepy, it's because you're trying to sell and market them with data they don't want you to use. And guess what? Nobody likes to be marketed to, nobody likes to be sold to, nobody likes to be advertised to. And for the most part, I kind of like really good targeted ads on my Facebook that remind me what's in my Amazon cart. But if we look at it and say, if we use this data to help someone solve a problem, to make their lives easier, to save them time, if we do these little things with that data, not only are they going to be thankful for us, but it's going to build trust at a whole new level. I mean, for years, marketers were asking, my, I remember my dad, my dad was a candy salesman, and my dad was always, I mean, he sold peanut brittle candy around the world. The company you know, ended up being a, a global company and sold it off with you know, Mars Candy and, and that kind of the space. But for him, he was always struggling to understand buyer habits, and he would spend hours in grocery stores just talking to people that decide on which kind of peanut brittle. And like, I was always like, dad, this is ridiculous. And funny enough, we now have all of that data at our disposal, and weirdly, we either collected random data because we figured out if someone's going to fill out a form, why not give them 27 entry points? We don't need any of those extra things. Like, why do you need to know like the, my projected family income and you know, whatever these things are. So, so like for us as marketers, we collected too much data, so then we couldn't use it. Or we got this data and now we're scared because there's some bad examples of using it. And so what I say with digital empathy is that we hear a lot about how do we get more in touch? How do we better understand our consumers? How do we, even as entrepreneurs, become better humans? 
And I do not believe unplugging and disconnecting from technology and social media is the answer. I believe that's an impossible feat. Innovation, technology, mobile phones, they're going to continue to innovate. They're going to continue to disrupt our, our lives, our world. It's kind of like saying, like, you know, it, I would say 20, 25 years ago, like, oh, my goodness, if you want to be, you know, more productive, you just need to not use power or water, right? Like, th this is kind of the world we're living in. The question now becomes, how do we use these and prioritize technology to simplify and do the things that are repetitive so we can spend more time being human? And how do we use social media to allow us to tell stories, but also not allow us to be impacted? Like, I mean, one of my soapboxes is anytime someone says this, and I, I probably need to write a whole blog on this, is that when someone tells me that they hate social media, it's toxic, and they hate, they don't log into Facebook because it's disgusting, the very first thing I fire back is, that's not Facebook's problem, that's your problem. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, it's Facebook. I'm like, no, you decide who to follow. You decide who is in your feed. And I, I, I did this recently, uh, beginning of 2018, is I realized a lot of my peers, my fellow peers that were friends, their, their lives were, were impacting my, my personal hygiene, my personal life, right? like my, my highs and my lows, because I would see things and I was realizing, wait a second, they're not my target customer. They're not my, 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 my current customer. And so I just started to unfollow. I started to unfollow. I, mean, I unfollowed 25% of the people that I was following. And all of a sudden, Facebook became helpful, inspirational, motivational. Now, I'm not saying to follow only people that are, are your own way of thinking. But when we look at it and we look at the social media or technology, we have two choices. We blame social media and technology for the bad things that are happening. And we're going to have to just continue doing that for years upon years upon years. Or we recognize that social media and technology have exposed that we as people need to change. We have been doing bad things. There's, there's plenty of bad in the world. And so then we as people need to fix our own people problems with people solutions and then leverage social media and technology to amplify the good, right? And so, you know, as a marketer, you know, advertising, like, I mean, I think this is the, the craziest thing is that when someone talks about advertising and I, I, I used the, actually I did this with an advertising audience and I said, you know, the user controls their feed and everyone in the ad people are like, except for the content that we create. And I was like, well, hold on a second. I'm curious from an advertiser's perspective, are you trying to advertise stuff that is disconnected and polarizing to your audience, to the people? Or are you trying to put your money and spend at the right audience that has curated what they want? And of course, every advertiser is like, of course, we're trying to get you know, the right connection of buyer and time. And I was like, so here's the thing. If we are, are better shepherds of our own feed and we curate, we're not liking random pages, we don't follow every single person, we, we kind of unfollow and block. All of a sudden, the data that we're giving to advertisers better serves us up quality information. Like my Instagram right now, I spend way too much money on Instagram ads, not, not advertising on buying products. The targeting that is available for brand, I mean, I just bought two hats today and they were it's from a company I never had heard of, but they had dropped their, they had dropped a really good video in my feed about three days ago. Yesterday, they had someone that I recognized wearing a hat. And then today they had a nice, beautiful call to action. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. And for me, I was like, wow, this worked amazingly because I got served up something that I would never would have been found otherwise. And it got presented to the point where I could, could actually activate it. But I can tell you it's because I, I own and shepherd my feed. So I think that's, that's the world where I'm at, where I, I understand the importance of disconnecting and not being too technology dependent. I'm not, I'm not a proponent of, of that side of the house, but I do believe telling people that our only way to feel human emotion, our only way to understand our consumers is to be less connected just is impossible, right? And so now it just says, where does technology fit? Where does the connection fit? How do we amplify the good? And if you want to make a difference in the world, first place you do is you tell your story. You allow people to be empathetic for you. I think that's one of the weirdest things, right? We want every single person listening to this. If I said, the world should be a more empathetic place, we're all going to say yes. And then I'm going to say, how much are you sharing about your life and your struggles and your, the vulnerabilities to allow people to be empathetic for you. You're like, uh, no, 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 thanks. And it's like, well, if we want the world to be more empathetic, we have to do it ourselves. And I can tell you, one of the coolest byproducts for that is, as soon as I own the fact that I talk fast, and you guys that are on the podcast, just don't listen to this at one and a half speed. And if you're already through this far at one and a half speed, you're getting used to me sounding like Mickey Mouse, because that's what I sound like. Um, but when I started owning the fact that, hey, I talk fast. Hey, I have ADHD and I own that. Hey, sometimes the chaos of managing my business and my inbox, I'm not great at it. All of a sudden, I took the power away from the haters and the trolls because they couldn't really come after me for anything that I'm open and transparent. And, uh, and like when someone, I mean, I just had a, just the other day, uh, two days ago when I got off stage, someone came up to me and said, Brian, I think what you were talking about is great. You have great passion, but all of the examples you, you had, 
uh, they don't connect with me at all. And I think you're, uh, you're, you're too driven by this fact that you want to change the world. You need a dose of reality. And I was like, man, hey, I appreciate that feedback. This is how I'm looking at it. I'm an optimist. And hey, I'm not for everyone, which is a hard lesson to learn. But I, I appreciate your feedback. It's something I'll think about. And you know what? I, I, I can recommend a couple other speakers that I think you should go see that are going to be really good at this, right? And, like, and so for me, it, it's, it's crazy. When you put yourself out there, you open yourself up to trolls and hatred and judgment. But then once you own it and you continue to do it and people realize that's who you are, they, they start to reward you for it. They start to commend you for it. They start to relate with you more. And that's where the bond is. I mean, when I meet people offline that have been following me for years, it is a giant hug. It is emotional. We don't talk about the weather. We don't talk about how you're doing. It is generally a sharing and connection. And so that's why for me, I don't look at online friends versus offline friends. I look at this entire world as how can we be more digitally empathetic? How can we understand each other better? It starts with us. The second place is we need to stop judging and start caring. Um, we all, as humans, are much more alike than we want to um, admit. And I think lastly is let's identify where we need to fix people problems and stop blaming technology because that's just a crutch that we're going to continue to use and the world's not going to be a better place. Thank you for that. I feel I, I want to ask you a question, though I also could go six more hours on <laughs> just what we've been talking about. So you might have to come back six more times, <laughs> but to be respectful, uh, I do want to ask you a question that I ask all my guests just so I can get your perspective on it. And then we could wrap up with just a little bit about where people can find you and what you're going on with. But so for you, do you believe that branding or selling is more important long-term for business and why? So branding or selling? Branding or selling. So, I mean, I, I, believe, I believe branding is more important. And I, and I would cl clarify that in the sense that I believe branding establishes trust, which is that, 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 that fuel and the platform. I think branding is built on a layer of trust. Now, that doesn't mean you can't build branding on uh, you know, faking and you know, selling unicorns and rainbows and, and complete crap. When we've seen that done with many businesses, you know, we have the Pharaohnosis of the world. We have even the Fire Festival. That, you know, I give an entire keynote on the 10 great things the Fire Festival did. And usually people are like, what in the world? But if I look at branding and selling, I think the interesting part when, when we're looking at all of this is that it goes down to the words that my dad taught me growing up. And he was always like, treat other people how you want to be treated. Realize that you cannot burn bridges and your reputation is everything. Be proud of the name that you have and who you are. But always remember that you care more about the front of any jersey you're wearing than you do about the name on the back. And I think when we look at branding, sometimes we get attached to branding and thinking it's us. And I always say control is an illusion, right? We can control what we individually do, but we can't control how other people think of us. We can simply put ourselves out there and allow people to judge, allow people to uh, examine. And I guess the, the, the reason I pick branding, that was a good question. The reason I really pick branding, I think more so than anything else, is I believe right now we're in a pivotal moment where consumers are starting to demand transparency. Transparency has gone from something that was a buzzword to something that started to be used and like it was kind of like oversharing and I always say transparency and oversharing aren't the same thing. Let's be clear there. No one wants to know that you're tweeting from the bathroom or you know checking Instagram from the toilet. We all know that you're all doing it, but we don't need to hear about it. But transparency, the weird thing with transparency is it doesn't guarantee trust. Transparency gives people a window into deciding if you're trustworthy or not. And so I believe as the consumer becomes more demanding of trust, the, the, the way that we're going to stand out is those that are selling and aren't being transparent with, you know, hey, do they actually have the product or the, 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 the service? You look at influencer marketing, influencer marketing, influencer marketing works. The problem that it, the reason it became, you know, a, a disconnect was people were faking it, weren't using the products and weren't believing what was going on and they lost the trust where, and, and when we come to, when it comes to selling for me, I think the element where we're moving towards is that you're not going to have to sell as much when your brand has an established trust. I can tell you when I talk about a tool or a product, I don't even have to give people an alternative tool to look at because they believe and trust me based on my brand that I would have done the due diligence before providing them a solution that I think is good for them. Where when I'm selling something and this is, I mean, I get this, I mean, I probably get two emails a week where it says, Brian, based on your audience, based on your engagement, based on what you're doing, I'm willing to pay you this X amount of dollars to sell this product or help us hawk this. And, I, and for me, the, there is a win there. There's plenty of people that do it, but I take great pride in saying the trust that I build around my brand long-term will far outweigh any short-term selling success that I have. And so I, I do like the question. It's something I, you know, I, I probably will even ponder on more after, but I, I think this is where it's so, I think we're living a, a really fun time 
only if you are a good person doing good things and have products and services that you can back up. And when you make a mistake, own it, right? If you make a mistake and then you, and like Target years ago, I, I used to use them as an example. They're much better now. But when Target first had the biggest like credit card exposure ever, Target had never replied on any social channel ever. And yet all of a sudden, as soon as this big exposure happened, they're like, please forgive us. Please, please love us. We don't, and all of a sudden they started engaging and my reply back and my screenshot I put on all these stages is like building a community after you screw up is not possible, right? Like you build a community and trust ahead of time, which for many managers is like, what's the ROI of community, right? And that's just like ROI of social media. Like the, I wouldn't even get that discussion, but if you look at it, if you build a community along the way and you screw up and life happens and you put it out there and you own it, you don't, you don't try to cover it up because we've seen Ubers in that world of doing that. But if you own it and put it out there that you own it, you'll be amazed because not only will the community come to your defense and give you a second chance, sometimes a third chance, a fourth chance, but the community will become your vehicle for defending you. The amount of brands that I've ended up defending when something bad happens because they've built up such a, an amazing amount of trust. They've never paid me a penny. We've never worked together as a business, but they've built up such trust and rapport and they care about my, my, you know, my uh, feedback back and forth. If something bad happens to them, I read a blog post and a podcast about how much I love that brand. And people are like, why are you doing that right now? I'm like, because they, they've built up that trust. And so I think this is a, a fun space that we're living in that if you are willing to invest in community now, the long-term benefits you're going to reap year over year, over failure, over pivot, over, you know, bad IPO loss versus good, you know, like all of these things that are happening. Uh, I mean, like Fiverr is a good example. Fiverr just had a, the most amazing uh, IPO that they've ever had. And, and funny enough, I've been celebrating Fiverr on their business model and their community driven uh, conversation, their transparency within their community and fully transparent. I have a call with them in 20 minutes because based on like the conversation they had, they're like, we want to work with you. We want to hire you as an influencer to you know, do some stuff with us. And I was amazed because if you think about it for me, they built a great community and they had a great IPO, but they weren't very much different than a lot of these other brands, Snapchat, for example, where Snapchat had a great user base, but they ignored the creators. They hated on the influencers. They told brands you buy ads or ads only. We don't care. You can't get discovered. And all of a sudden they go live and they start to tank and nobody's coming to the defense. And that reason was, is if you neglect community now and the mistake is bound to happen, every brand's going to be hacked, every brand's going to screw up and you try to, to abort ship that late, it's, it's an ugly mess. Now I will say Snapchat is not going away. Snapchat will be reinvented. They, they have some geniuses there and they're doing a much better job. But um, I think it's, it's, we're living in a fun space and I, I do, I, not hating on the sellers or the sales teams, but for me, um, I, I do look at, uh, you know, at that trust level. Although the irony there is though the funny part is the skill that I wish I had more than anything else was the ability to sell my dad's a candy salesman he's freaking genius he knows how to negotiate and value prop and he, um, I've read more books on sales both of my mentors that I have right now are, are sales geniuses and it's because the it's definitely my weakest spot so I might be a little biased on the answer just simply because sales to me is is one of the uh, the hardest skill sets that are out there so those that have them I, I give you kudos no I, I feel the exact same way it's something I, I think we all need to work on Overall, as long as you're working towards providing actual value and it's an even exchange and it's a, you come to a, a mutually beneficial thing, great. Like sell something, make, you know, make it more worth it than their money and then you're fine. I would love people to be able to find you in all the places you are, but you know, where, where do you like sending people when they're looking for you? So if, I think the last piece of advice I will give people is that in this crazy crowded digital world we live in, the number one way, I told you, the number one way to stand out was consistency, right? Consistency is also included in your branding and your messaging. I am I social fans, a letter I social F A N Z or Z. My last name's Fanzo. That's the play on that. I am that on every channel. My website is I social fans. My email is Brian at I social fans. Trying to make it very easy for people to follow me. Now I do have multiple other accounts. I have three uh, Instagram accounts that I that I currently run. I'm launching a vlog with my girlfriend called the Take Two Couple, and we're really trying to be authentically sharing long distance relationship, both of us uh, being divorced with kids uh, and kind of opening that up. So you went to take two couple.com. But if you went to every social channel, guess what my handle is take two couple the number two, uh, take the number two couple. And so consistency, it, it, it's, it, it's beyond important. Uh, I will say if I had to go back and do it all over again, I probably would just would have created my brand around Brian Fanzo um, as the you know, my name is my name is rare enough and cool enough to do that. But uh, 
I, I started off with eight Twitter accounts because I, because I have no niche and I, <laughs> and every one of them, I was like, Oh, I'll just make one with underscore fans. Cause I'm like a fan. So it was like a technology underscore fans was a Twitter account, you know, and poker underscore and in Pittsburgh underscore. And little did I know that uh, the, the name I social fans became what I got introduced for. And for many years, no one knew my first name. It was that as my branding. So yeah, check me out. And I, I like to tell people, you know, I have, I have two podcasts, uh, FOMO Fans, which is I cure your fear of missing out around digital marketing and entrepreneurship every week. And then just try this. Amy Landino and I launched that. It's a podcast. We, our goal was to bring you on the couch with us. We don't interview each other. We don't dive in crazy on any topics. We have a conversation about things that we have experienced as entrepreneurs, as content creators. Uh, we, we finished season one. Season one's been out there. There's 10 episodes. Uh, we're going to be recording season two in a couple of weeks. So you, got, you can stay tuned uh, for, for that coming out on that channel. But uh, most of all, if you give me a follow just on your favorite channel, that's all you need to do. I, I do create content everywhere, all day, every day. But I don't believe you need to be on every channel. I don't believe you need to follow me on every channel because I'll probably annoy you. Kind of like Gary Vee. I, I, had, I had to pick like one channel for Gary or Gary is a little uh, you know, inundating. And, and, I, and I say the same here. But, you know, Brendan, thanks for, thanks for staying on top of me. Thanks for uh, having me here. I can tell you, your list of guests are impressive. I, I get to see the, the, the pop-ups. I've been following you. And, you know, the people that you're getting on the show is a testament to, you know, your commitment of reaching out, your commitment of uh, kind of building that rapport. And I, and I think that's, a, that's an example for anyone that's listening. If you want to launch a show or build a show, the community building, the outreach, you know, the fact that you, you know, I can tell you, I, I turned down probably 25 podcast guest opportunities this, uh, so far this year, uh, not because I don't like helping other people out, but uh, I did have to kind of prioritize my time. Uh, but the fact you reached out and shook my hand at, at Social Media Market World and we had a conversation, um, made it a no brainer. I didn't even hesitate at it. So kudos to you for doing it the right way. And, and I had a great time. Well, thanks for coming on today, man. Appreciate it. Cheers. You've just taken your marketing knowledge to another level with this episode of Brands on Brands on Brands. But we have plenty more ways to not just help you build a business, but build a brand. Head over to brandandbrands.com for more resources, as well as access to our blogs, videos, and exclusive coaching sessions with your host. Be sure to visit brandandbrands.com.